Uh, so hi everyone. Uh, we are very happy to have Yidrong Yu from uh, UCSD today to talk about symmetric mass generation. Uh, Yidrong, please take your room. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, uh, Jia Wan and Zhu Wen, for inviting me. And actually, I did a lot of works with Zhu Wen recently, and we wrote a review paper on symmetric mass generation. Uh, so uh, this is the this is the we 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 put that on symmetry and then uh, it's also Simon in, in, invited us to do that uh, write that review so thanks for that and then uh, uh, the archive version we will update pretty soon so uh, the previous archive version contains some mistakes so uh, I recommend you read this paper on the journal website it's a uh, I think open access so everyone can download. Okay, so today's talk is essentially uh, about this uh, uh, symmetric mass generation. I will only focus on one story which we review in this uh, review paper, which is about symmetric mass generation in one plus one D. But that actually uh, tells us, already tells us a lot of things about symmetric ma mass generation of different aspects. So I think that's, uh, that's my plan. Okay, so symmetric mass generation, what's that? Uh, so we all know fermions can have mass. And then symmetric mass generation is just a novel way to give uh, fermions a mass. So before talking about this novel mass, maybe let's first review what we learn about or what we know about fermion mass. The most conventional <coughs> way to give mass to fermions is called fermion bilinear mass. So the setup is you consider that there is some relativistic fermion in d-dimensional space-time such that the action of the fermion field can be written as this bilinear form where you may have some uh, Dirac fermion which you can uh, put the mass term here and mass term is just a bilinear form of the fermion and this psi bi is just psi dagger followed by the gamma zero matrix for Dirac fermions. But uh, you may also think this also apply to Marana fermions if these fermion fields are real, and then it's just a, a convention. You just redefine psi bar. But anyway, the, in general, fermion bilinear mass, no matter it's a Dirac mass or Marana mass, generally takes some form <coughs> like this. And by taking this form, then we can uh, start from this kind of action and take the uh, action principle, we take the derivative of action with respect to the field. So that gives us a, a equation of motion or the, uh, or the set of point equation. But this equation of motion essentially tells us that the fermion will propagate uh, with a dispersion relation like that, or you can say it's an unshared relation, uh, which means the fermion energy and the fermion momentum will satisfy a relation uh, that is standard dispersion uh, relation of massive relativistic fermion. And then there will be an energy gap uh, between the upper band and the lower band. So uh, this is the single particle spectrum of the fermion. So in, in terms of the many body physics, then in the ground states, the many body state of the fermion will occupy all the lower bands. So if you want to create any fermion excitation in the system, you will have to overcome this gap. So this system is gapped. Uh, in, in this sense. And then when you overcome the gap and create a single particle excitation, the excitation will follow a dispersion like that, which means if you push it with a, some, push this fermion with some force, it will, it will not immediately, it will generate some acceleration, which has a F equals MA kind of acceleration. Then this M mass is also associated with the curvature of the dispersion uh, near the bottom of the dis dispersion. So uh, in either sense, you can call this a mass. Either you can say it, the mass correspond to this gap, or you can say the mass correspond to this curvature here. And there's another way to think about mass. It's uh, in fermion correlation. So we can, uh, we can calculate, because this is a field theory, you can calculate two point function of the fermion by inserting the fermion operator into this uh, path integral. And then, uh, then it can be shown that this uh, fermion correlation will exponential decay is as long as there's a mass here and the decay lens will be inversely proportional uh, to the mass parameter here. So it seems that there are many different ways to define fermion mass. And that's what we know about fermion bilinear mass. But what is the suitable definition of fermion mass beyond, beyond this free, free fermion limit? 
because beyond this free fermion limit, we can no longer solve the equation of motion in the presence of the fermion interaction. Fermion interaction meaning that in the action, you may have some full fermion term, then uh, you can't really write down a simple equation like that. And then this dispersion relation doesn't make sense. So ev everything that I talk about that has to do with this dispersion relation doesn't really make sense. But you can still define the notion of, uh, uh, because that, that is because in the presence of uh, interaction, you may not even be able to uh, define a quasi particle. However, we can still define correlation function. This is still a way to define uh, what, is, what do we mean by fermion mass. So, so one can still uh, calculate correlation and say that if the correlation decay, for example, in a power law manner, with the power being the two times the scaling dimension of the fermion, then that corresponds to a gapless fermion phase. However, uh, if the fermion has a gap, usually in the correlation function, you will have a exponential decay correlation function. Uh, and the inverse correlation lens can be used to define uh, a, a mass. And then this is also consistent with the fermionic excitation gap in the many body spectrum. So when we come to this many body physics, uh, we can use correlation lens or excitation gap to define fermion mass. So then the symmetric mass generation. So when we talk about fermion mass generation, essentially is how can we, we have a system of fermion, how can we create uh, a situation where the fermion correlation is short range and the many body excitation has a gap. So that's essentially what we mean by mass generation. So it does not necessarily mean that we need to write down a mass term uh, as a fermion bilinear term in our action. So that opens up new possibility to create this so-called excitation gap or short range correlation in the fermionic theory. So the, this, this diagram concludes the most general at least up to now, what we know uh, general schemes of uh, giving fermion system a mass in the sense that it's uh, gapping out the fermion system. So, uh, so the whole diagram relies on the assignment of symmetry. So symmetry plays a very important role in classifying different kinds of fermion masses. So uh, if you have a symmetry group, and then let's say the fermion field uh, transform under the symmetry with some representation, which I denoted R psi G. So this representation depends on the fermion field and it's a representation of the group G. So given this information, you can try to classify all different uh, approach to generate fermion mass. So first of all, you can ask whether there exists symmetric bilinear mass. So meaning that if you, I write down side by side this operator, is this operator symmetric under G already? If that is true, then I can safely uh, open up uh, bilinear mass without breaking symmetry. And I'm very happy with that. So that's one possibility. You just explicitly turn on this term. However, if there does not exist any symmetric bilinear, meaning that any bilinear form of uh, like mass term like this will somehow break the symmetry, then you have to make a choice. Then you can ask, at this, uh, at this point, do I need to preserve the symmetry? Do I want to preserve the symmetry? If I want to preserve the symmetry of the action, then uh, it's more uh, difficult. But if I don't want, if I don't care this symmetry, even this action has a symmetry, I don't, uh, want to preserve it, then probably I can spontaneously break the symmetry, meaning that the actions still have the symmetry, but my ground state can break the symmetry, such that in my ground state, I can spontaneously generate some of this fermion bilinear mass. And in that way, you can still give mass to fermion at low energy. And that's actually Anderson Higgs mechanism or spontaneous symmetry breaking mechanism. So that's uh, also uh, rather conventional, which we know already. But uh, what we want to discuss uh, uh, more, more recently actually is this uh, new uh, direction where you can, uh, you, can, you can preserve symmetry and give fermion MS by so-called symmetry extension. You actually need to extend the symmetry group into a larger group and try to, uh, try to do something there. <laughs> and then uh, I won't enter that detail, but uh, within that class of uh, uh, ideas, uh, there's another criterion, which is about whether the symmetry group is anomaly free. If the symmetry group is anomaly free, then you can just uh, uh, open up the gap and without generating other topological order. But if it's not anomaly free, meaning that you cannot trivially gap out the fermion, then probably you uh, either the system still remains in a conformal field theory a state, which does not have a mass, or the system, if you really want to give an excitation gap, 
to the many body system, then there's one possibility is to, uh, to use anomalous uh, topological quantum field theory. So in that case, we say it's a topological mass, but today we are going to focus on this uh, symmetric mass generation, which means that uh, fermion bilinear, all the fermion bilinear term breaks the symmetry, but we still wish to preserve symmetry at the ground state. So we should think about something more uh, you know, in innovative. And then we should uh, try to see how to uh, create a mass there. And this symmetric mass generation applies to the scenario where the system does not have any G anomaly of the symmetry. Okay. So uh, essentially, uh, if you are not allowed to turn on any fermion bilinear mass because that breaks symmetry, then probably the only thing you can add to the action is to add fermion interactions. So usually symmetric mass generation is realized by uh, interacting fermions, by applying interaction to this gapless fermion systems. But then what is the designing principle? It's not like any interaction you can just put into the system that will do the job. Usually it's not the case. So there are two actually criteria one is called the kinetics, uh, the other is dynamical criterion. The kinetic criterion is basically say that the system does not should not have any anomaly because anomaly is an obstruction towards gapping. So that's you need to have anomaly cancellation. And the dynamic criterion is that the interaction really need to leads to this uh, gap phase, meaning that there exists interaction to drive the system into a new RG fixed point where all the low energy fermions are trivially gapped. So, so the condition that there exists such an interaction is a dynamical criterion because you don't know a priori, you have to do, usually you have to do some simulation uh, in order to determine whether the interaction will work. But so that is actually the gapping condition. However, in one plus one D, it turns out that these two conditions are equivalent and there is a deep relation between each other, which is uh, revealed in uh, Juven's uh, recent work. So let me talk about this uh, one plus one D example first. Uh, so this one plus one D example of symmetric exam uh, mass generation, uh, the name of the the name of the model is called three four five zero. It has a very weird name, but the, this three four five zero basically correspond to our charge assignment to certain chiral fermion in one plus one D. So the model contains four chiral fermions in uh, in a one plus one dimensional space time. So you have one dimensional space, one dimensional time, and the fermion has this uh, standard gapless fermion kind of uh, uh, action. And there are four of them labeled by this uh, index A goes from one to four. And there will be, I will add some interaction later, but for now, let's not worry about this interaction. So this four chiral fermion field in this theory, I want to specify what kind of symmetry it has. So if you just look at the theory, the theory has a very large symmetry, it has a U4 symmetry, but basically all the four fermion can rotate. But that's not Think about that large symmetry. Let's uh, focus on a specific one U1 cross U1 prime symmetry. Because later on, you will see interaction will break the full U4 symmetry, but still preserve this U1 cross U1 prime symmetry. So what do I mean by that? That means under U1 and U1 prime rotation, the fermion field will gain a phase vector. But different fermion field indexed by this A, A equals one, two, three, four, they gain different phase factors. And the phase factor that they gain has to do with the charge carried by the fermion. So the charge assignment is such that psi one, two, three, four fermions separately carry charge three, four, five, zero under the first U1 and carry charge zero, five, four, three under the second U1, U1 prime. And that's the charge assignment. And also this fermion, you notice that there's a velocity term here, which specify the, whether the fermion is left or right moving. So the assignment, the model is such that the first two fermions is left moving with a positive velocity and the second two fermions is right moving with a negative velocity. So, so maybe the most clear way to summarize what I said just now is this picture that I have four fermions. They are all chiral fermions in 1D, two left moving, two right moving. And in the bracket, it is the charge assignment under the first U1 and the second U1. And that's it, that's the model. So this model, you can uh, also view this model as a one-sided boundary of a multi-layer two plus one dimensional integer quantum Hall insulator. And every layer contributes a Hall conductance, assuming, uh, so the Hall conductance is given by, by uh, VQ square, assuming E square over H is one. So, so in, in terms of the unit Hall conductance units, then, so for example, 
uh, the Psi1 layer will contribute, I think, uh, a nine unit of Hall conductance uh, for the first U1 and zero unit of a whole conductor for the second U1 and things like that. So, uh, so there are because you we have two U1 symmetry, so we can define two Hall conductors, sigma and sigma prime, like that. And then uh, the the anomaly free condition condition essentially is saying that uh, uh, you shouldn't anomaly free meaning that this one plus one dimensional system should be viewed as a standalone. 1D system. So it shouldn't rely on the two-dimensional bulk, which means that the two-dimensional bulk should have a trivial Hall conductance. Uh, trivial meaning that the Hall conductance must vanish in both U1 and U1 prime symmetry. So uh, if you just add up the Hall conductance co co contribution from each chiral fermion, then you can show that the assignment of 3450 is very nice in the sense that it nicely cancel out all the all these whole conductance is because three square and four square minus five square is zero. Uh, so so that's uh, that's uh, a, a famous Pythagorean uh, number, a, a triple of a Pythagorean number. So so that's uh, that's why the assignment is like three four five zero. And more generally, that's actually that's not sufficient yet because there might be a mixed anomaly between U one and U one prime. So we also need to check that. So uh, so so maybe the most general way to check the uh, uh, anomaly cancellation is to take the charge vector, which is uh, this Q correspond to the charge assignment of the fermions. So there are two charge vector correspond to uh, two different U1 uh, symmetries. So you require that this uh, Q, K, Q uh, equals zero, where K is the, uh, uh, is the K matrix, uh, which describe the chirality of, the, uh, of these uh, fermions, essentially. Okay, so uh, however, uh, we, we just check that the, the system, when you assign the charge in this way, then it's anomaly free. However, this U1 cross U1 prime symmetry is still very uh, restrictive in the sense that it forbids any backscattering on the free fermion level, meaning that there is no trivial mass term. Because if you write down a trivial mass, no matter with, with, whether by trivial mass, I mean trivial bilinear mass. So uh, if you want to write down any bilinear mass, no matter it's the Dirac mass, which looks like this, or Marana mass, which looks like, like this, it necessarily need to take one fermion from one, uh, one uh, chain, let's say, from one chiral fermion to another chiral fermion, right? Or you want to generate a pair of fermion between these lines. But no matter which, uh, which way you do, you can check. There's no way that this operator carries no symmetry charge because all these chiral fermions, no matter under the first U1 or under the second U1, they have distinct charge assignments, three, four, five, zero. None of them is the same. So no matter you take one fermion from here to here, then you violate charge conservation. If you try to simultaneously create two fermions like this and this, you still violate charge conservation. So any of these mass terms will violate charge conservation and is forbidden by the both of the U1 symmetry. Of course, this both U1 may be an overkill, but at least it shows that there's no possibility to turn on any bilinear mass between any pair of these uh, chiral fermions. So what we, but but we have just argued, uh, or we have just checked that it's uh, the system is anomaly free, meaning that there is in principle no obstruction towards gapping. So you should be able to gap out all these left and right moving fermions simultaneously. And I also want to say that uh, the system is also free from gravitational anomaly that uh, I didn't mention previously. So uh, it seems that there's no obstruction towards gapping, but there's no, no way to do that on the free fermion level. So that must be an interaction driven gapping term. So the correct SMG interaction, the interaction to drive uh, the system from this gapless chiral fermion to the gapped fermion phase uh, is actually proposed by Zhuven and Xiaogang back in 2013. And this interaction was recently verified by numerics uh, in our more recent uh, uh, DMRG numerical work. So uh, the interaction term, you, uh, if you write down on the field theory level, it is a six fermion interaction term, one, two, three, four, five, six. It contains six fermions. So it seems to be a very complicated interaction. And you can also write 
write down this interaction term on the lattice. Uh, for example, you can realize this chiral fermion as the boundary of a two-dimensional lattice model of an integer quantum hall. And then you can try to apply this interaction on one of the edges and see what is the result. So that is actually the calculation we do in this uh, work, where we perform a DMRG simulation of these interacting fermion systems on uh, one side, uh, where we, we start from a 2D uh, quantum integer quantum hall state and then apply interaction only on one side of the edge. And then we just focus on that side of the edge where we apply interaction and we measure fermion two-point function. And then what we see is that this fermion two-point function as a function of the separation of the fermion operator, which is along the X direction, it decays in a power law manner if the interaction strength is very small. However, if we keep cranking up this interaction G1 and G2, which we collectively denoted as G, when G exceeds certain critical value GC, uh, what we see is that this fermion, uh, two fermion, uh, fermion two point function uh, start to decay exponentially as a function of the distance. You may forget about this uh, noise. Uh, this is uh, some, some uh, because the MRG simulation has some truncation error. So, that's the, the, the real data is here. So, so you can, can you see say a little bit more about where the six fermion term comes from. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm going to explain that very soon. So, so let me first show you the, uh, the, 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 the effect. So at least this numerics uh, make, uh, give us some confidence <laughs> that this is a correct interaction. And, and actually the history comes the other way around because Juven and Xiaogan, they derive this six fermion from gapping conditions. So I, I'm going to talk about that very soon, but let me first mention the significance of this result is that it demonstrates a new possibility to regularize chiral fermion on the lattice. At, at least this is one in this one plus one D model. And hopefully, of course, we wish that these uh, ideas can be generalized to three plus one D model, which is more interest uh, uh, to uh, of more interest to us. So the idea is actually is very early known as mirror or domain wall fermion approach, which dates back to Ichten and Preskill, that if you have some uh, chiral fermion, you try to uh, regularize that, and you can try to introduce a mirror sector and try to apply interaction in the mirror sector and, and to trivialize the mirror sector or to completely gap out the mirror sector such that it dec decouples from the gapless chiral sector, then you can realize the chiral fermion. So, so uh, with both mirror and chiral sector, the full model can be written on a lattice, no problem. So now if you apply the interaction, then you really achieve a lattice regularization of these chiral fermions. So that's, uh, that's the goal. But, uh, but then the question is exactly as, as you asked, why SMG interaction is so complicated? Why involve six fermions? Why, why is that? And in fact, we can even show that one and one's uh, six fermion interaction is already the most relevant interaction allowed by the so-called gapping condition. Meaning that if you try to design anything simpler, it's anything, I mean, any interaction that is simpler than that, <laughs> it's not going to work. So for example, you may think, uh, can I do that on the four fermion level? That's not going to work. So any four fermion interaction is not going to uh, give you a gap. So that requires us to understand this gapping condition, which is the dynamical condition. What kind of interaction will gap out the fermion? That's also very important. And in order to analyze that in Juven's paper, what they do is that they uh, perform a bosonization, bosonize the fermion field into e to the i phi, where phi is some scalar, uh, some compact boson field. So, okay, so because I have four fermions, I still have uh, correspondingly four boson, and the boson field will be described by a Lattinger liquid theory whose uh, Lagrangian is given in this form, which contains uh, some K matrix describe this uh, Berry phase term and some V matrix describing the Lattinger parameter in general. And the K matrix essentially uh, is uh, uh, describe the chiral fermion. So you have two left moving mode and two right moving mode. It sets the velocity of the fermion field. But when we will try to add interaction to this system, so 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 the first line describes the gapless limit, uh, the the free fermion limit of this uh, uh, one dimensional system. And then if you add interaction, it turns out this six fermion interaction can be interpreted as some cosine term that add to this uh, uh, compact boson theory, uh, cosine L dot phi. 
So phi is a, is a vector which contains phi one, two, three, four. And this L is also a four component vector, which tells us how to combine all these five fields together in the cosine term in order to generate a gapping term. So this L, there are two different interactions that has been added to the system, G1 and G2, and which is correspond to the, the interaction vector, these two vectors, uh, it turns out. So now comes the gapping condition. The gapping condition is this condition. So that means you cannot arbitrarily write down some four fermion or eight fermion or arbitrary fermion interaction. Uh, any interaction will correspond, any backscattering interaction will correspond to some, some kind of this vector. But this vector is not arbitrarily designed. These vectors must be designed in such a way that it satisfies this condition. Uh, so let me explain why there is such a condition. So this fully gapped boundary can only uh, be consistently achieved. So, uh, so, so by condensing a maximally set of bulk excitation. So when I talk about bulk excitation, let me remind that uh, our idea of, uh, is to view this chiral fermion as the one plus one dimensional boundary of a two plus one dimensional U1 cross U1 uh, gauge theory. Uh, well, uh, originally I say it's a U1 cross U1 quantum hall insulator, but you can try to gauge it and the bulk becomes a gauge theory. And then uh, this gauge theory automatically basically enforce symmetry on the boundary by gauging the symmetry in the bulk. So, uh, so now as a gauge theory, you can talk about bulk excitations in the gauge theory. So the bulk excitation correspond to all these uh, vertex operators, all these uh, uh, gauge charge, basically. This operator creates gauge charge in the bulk. And then the idea to, to gap out the boundary uh, turns out to be you just need to condense all these uh, bulk uh, gauge charge uh, to the boundary. Uh, but there's a condition for this gauge charge con to condense on the boundary. Uh, that is, this gauge charge must be self-boson and mutual boson. Because in the gauge theory, it is possible that gauge charge can have mutual braiding. It's just like anions. And then maybe sometimes due to some non-trivial effect, Chen Simon's effect, this gauge charge can carry non-trivial statistics. So you don't want those things to happen. Because when that happens, you can't really put treat this gauge charge as independent boson and condense them. And then, uh, so, but if you can condense the gauge charge, then you can argue that this boundary will enter the Higgs phase. And in the Higgs phase, everything is gapped. Uh, so there's no gapless degree of freedom remaining at the low energy. So the idea is to, to, to achieve a fully gap phase by condensing this gauge charge. But the condition to do that is this gauge charge is self boson and mutual boson, meaning that there should not be any mutual or self statistics. And the way to calculate the statistics is using this formula in the Chen Simon theory, turns out in the bulk. And then uh, in the bulk, uh, that, that condition basically leads to the gapping condition on the boundary. So when this condition is satisfied, then all these operators are, uh, 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 are condensable. And then, uh, so we call them condensable operator. And then you also want to check that uh, uh, this uh, actually uh, is also neutral. Uh, the operator that you condense actually is also neutral under U1 plus U1 transformation, such that the interaction doesn't explicitly breaks uh, the symmetry explicitly. How much so, of this structure is related to, you know, yeah. the details of the model here? The fact you have this three, four, five, zero model, for example, and it's abelian and lives in two dimensions. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I have to talk about that. Is all of this so determined that, by that? Or? So you can see the 3450 coming from this charge vector Q. So uh, when we assign a fermion with different charge, then mm -hmm. you have this Q vector. So uh, this L vector also needs to uh, be, uh, you, you don't want to, you want to have an inner product which is zero, meaning that when you perform a, a symmetry transformation, this cosine term. When you perform a symmetry translation, meaning that phi goes to q times theta, and then phi, phi plus q times theta, so you 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 want uh, the symmetry. Sure, sure. The but it needs to be abelian. This would not immediately generalize to non-abelian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This doesn't immediately generalize, but maybe it generalizes to the Cartan subgroup of the non-abelian mm. case. Mm. So that still provides some constraint, but that's not a full constraint. So. So the full story about non-abelian cases, uh, I, I think at least not fully clear to me yet, mm -hmm. but, uh, but this is one condition. So you mm -hmm. basically need to have this charge vector being 
mutual boson and also satisfy the symmetry condition. Uh, Julian, you have a question. You can, you can make some comment. Uh, one thing is that this model, although present in a way, say view the one plus one D color fermion theory as a boundary of a two plus one D bulk. Uh, I think uh, the whole statement doesn't really require leave, leave, having this one plus one D theory living on the boundary of two plus one D bulk at all, because it's an anomaly free, so it's, it can exist. Mm -hmm. Uh, the reason we want to put on two plus one D bulk just for convenience to have a fermion doubling with both chiral fermion and mirror fermion sector. And we get a mirror fermion to left over with the chiral fermion theory at, at the end. However, if the purpose is just try to get the chiral fermion by its own, then we don't need to put it on the boundary of two plus one D bulk. And another thing following this is another thing is the second the two plus one D bulk is finite width. So you can just view this quantum degree freedom as some uh the you know several extra uh degree freedom truncate by truncate the extra width to the same dimension in one plus one d so the whole system can still be viewed as one plus one d even if we have a finite width two plus one d and I, I think that part sh should be clear to the audience hopefully and another comment is i i feel the u1 plus u1 times u1 prime this the symmetry layer does doesn't really require to be gauged for the argument on this slide i, I think we can just keep the u1 uh, as okay global symmetry i try to make an analogy to any so where where the yeah that's totally unsafe but but uh, that's true yeah yeah that, that's true. Yeah, relay anion certainly is thinking about dynamical gauge field. That's probably yeah, yeah, yeah. easy. But but even, for, yeah. even for big on gauge, non dynamical field, the conditions still hold. Yes. yes. Right. I mean, okay. I should think of them as, as just a top anomaly cancellation condition, right? Uh, it's, it's, actually, it's actually related. I'm going to talk about that. Uh, uh, okay, maybe I can say that. So, but, but let me say one more thing to Simon is that this model is nothing special at all. It's just a anomaly free model. You can take any, any charge you want. 3450 is not special. It's just simplest color from your in one plus one D with U1 charge. It's not special at all. Any, any, take any U1 and possibly even non abelian and cotton star group. I think similar construction will work. Mm -hmm. And this design is a principle design based on the relation between anomaly free condition and the statistics of choosing a set of operators as an ending of some extent objects to the two plus one D or higher dimension, one higher dimensional bulk and check the statistics conditions. And that condition, I think I mentioned to you when we met at the um, Syracuse University, I kind of tell you this principle, but I cover it too, too abstract. And this notion is also related to what people are checking about this so-called generalized central charge beyond the central charge of gravitational anomaly CL minus CR, the coefficient, there's a higher central charge. But that notion is exactly relates to this uh, gapping condition by checking the statistics of uh, operators extend to the higher dimensional bulk. The design principle works, she works in higher dimension, just that checking statistics of extend operators in higher dimension is more complicated, possibly required to do some surgery on higher dimensional manifold with some link invariant wanting to check those things and how to relate this operators that can end on the boundary how do you choose the correspondent between the interaction term as a deformation and the the uh, the statistics over this extend operator in higher dimension how, how to relate them is something more tricky but 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 anyway yeah that's a comment thanks yeah so at least in 1d uh, 1 plus 1d there is uh, uh, some systematic understanding so the question we are facing here is that we are given the charge assignment of this fermion which is specified by the charge vector q and we try to design interactions that can add to this fermion system to gap out the fermions where the interaction is specified by these l vectors which appears in these uh, cosine terms which specify these cosine terms so so the relation it turns out that the solution to this problem is you take your charge assignment uh, multiplied by the k matrix that give you your l vector so you can design interaction based on your understanding of the charge assignment given the fermions uh, k matrix which specify the chirality of the fermion the reason that this is a valid solution because this solution simultaneously unify the three conditions one is anomaly cancellation condition that is the first condition that the, this condition equals zero says to prove the anomaly free. And then the second condition is symmetry requirement. You require that under U1 transformation, your interaction 
interaction shouldn't violate the symmetry. So the L vector and the charge vector should have a trivial uh, inner product. And then uh, the, also the gapping condition, meaning that you would require the cosine term to be consistent with each other in the sense that this, uh, uh, the, this uh, uh, condensable operator can simultaneously condense on the boundary and that should have trivial braiding, self braiding and mutual braiding that this braiding statistics condition it must also vanish. But you can see these three equation essentially is the same equation. Once you notice that L is related to Q by K times Q and when you substitute that equation into here, then all these three equations is the is essentially the same thing. So this is the this is uh, basically the designing principle that if we start from the charge assignment, which is the Q vector three four five zero and five zero five four three, and then we can multiply that with the K matrix that give me the L vector, which is this two uh, column vector again. So basically, that means I just need to apply interaction uh, to the system where I take uh, the first fermion to the third power, second fermion to the fourth power, third fermion with a Hermitian conjugate to the fifth power, and then something like that. That should be a valid interaction. But you can see this interaction is too complicated. Uh, it contains, let's say, three plus four plus five, 12 inter fermion interaction. So is there any simpler ones? So I should say that these L vector essentially, it, it only specify two uh, independent condensable operator, but actually all the condensable operator in the system, by condensable, I mean, all the operator that satisfy these uh, uh, trivial mutual statistic and self-statistic condition, they actually forms an operator algebra. And the op operator algebra in, in that operator algebra, all these condensable operator are arranged on a lattice. And it is a set of operator which all take the similar form as a vertex operator, where this L vector is taken from, uh, from the space that is spanned by this L1 and L2, which are the solutions that we obtain just now, and then uh, also intersect with all the Z4 lattice. So Z4 lattice is all the possible operator in the system. And this uh, space spanned by L1, L2 is the is essentially the submanifold in this uh, system where the operators are condensable. So all the condensable operators are arranged in this lattice where the origin of the lattice correspond to the trivial operator or identity operator. And then these are uh, also operator we obtain, but you can see this lattice is uh, actually contains other smaller operator, meaning that the length of the operator is shorter uh, length of this vector is shorter. What, what, what's the significance of the lens? Well, the operator scaling dimension, it turns out that in this system is associated with this lens. Uh, it's a uh, one half uh, L transpose L. So L is this uh, lens of this, uh, L is this vector. So at least this is the scaling dimension of this operator at the free fermion fixed point. So of course, we, we want to start from the free fermion and apply the interaction, drive it to a gap phase. We wish that the interaction is as, as relevant as possible. That's, that's, uh, you don't need to pay a huge effort to drive that. So, so you, 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 you usually want to choose the shortest vector. So you search on the lattice and choose the shortest vector. It turns out to be these two vector. And then these two vector, you just now in, reinterpret as six fermion interaction. So uh, the, uh, this vector, you just read out the first fermion, you need one. The second fermion, you need to put the dagger and put it twice. But you cannot have two side two at the same point, right? So there must be some point splitting implemented by this partial X operator. And then the third fermion, there's also one and the fourth fermion, you have two. And then that's one interaction. That's the other interaction. That's the idea to design the two interactions. So the interaction- Sorry, Can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, uh, about the gapping condition, uh, you have this L, trans uh, L transpose K inverse L. Um, as zero, could it be like zero mod two pi or does it have to be zero uh, exactly? What happened here? Yeah, I think we'll lost, uh, lost the connection. I can comment and maybe you don't can comment later. Oh, sorry. I just lost. Sorry. Uh, uh, maybe Julian, you can continue comment. Uh, 
I think it's, it's a nice question. It's a great question. Naively, if you just want to have a trivial statistics, it could just be two pi integer for that for that for that the uh, two pi times some integer. So so that 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 condition doesn't seem to require the vanish of the this the l l k inverse l to be zero. But uh, I think for for safety, usually we do require that. I think this is a subtle question. Probably we will not discuss that. No, but it's a good question. Yeah, 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 yeah. In the bulk for any on statistics, it turns out the trivial is you can mod two pi or mod integer in, in this case. But uh, but for gapping a CFT, it turns out the condition is even stricter. Yeah. So so these operators look like you know what I would normally consider them irrelevant operators, right? Even in two dimensions right. because they have so num large numbers of fermions. And yet yeah. they only seem to work at weak coupling where I ought to be able to trust perturbation theory. So, so you can't trust the perturbation theory at the free fermion fixed point. That's that's the that's the point. Yeah. So, so say again. The, you can't trust the perturbation theory at the free fermion level because this this uh, SMG is a non-perturbative uh, interaction effect, meaning that this interaction need to be strong enough in order to drive the transition. Sure. So, so I, that would make sense to me if therefore you found the right phase at very strong coupling, because then your yeah, yeah, yeah. So, theory is not reliable. So, so, so the point is that you need to view this uh, theory as the trend. You, you need to start from the SMG transition fixed point. That transition point has a CFT. You need to mm -hmm. take that CFT as your starting point, and then you can reliably analyze the theory. You I can't see. take the free fermion fixed point as your starting point. That's not going to tell you anything. <laughs> That's the free fermion fixed point is just, just telling you free fermion is stable under all the in perturbative interaction. So, so I think that's the. Uh, that's actually you what know, I, I, th I thought. I thought at one point you had a picture which showed that the you got the right spectrum or the oh, sorry the right power uh -huh. behavior even for very yeah small yeah yeah I, I'm going to show that soon yeah yeah yeah, yeah so, I'm going to explain this yeah okay. so so at weak interaction the interaction has a very large scaling dimension but you can show that the scaling dimension can actually be tuned I see. until it becomes relevant. It, it can be tuned to a point where it becomes the space-time dimension. Then mm. the interactions start to become relevant. Then you enter the SMG phase after this point. Oh, I see. So the SMG <laughs> phase is at relatively large G then. I, I, maybe yes, I misread yes. your old plot. Yeah, okay. Yes, yes, yes. So, so, so you shouldn't analyze the scaling dimension of the six fermion interaction term at the three fermion fixed point, which is here, when the interaction strength is zero, then the scaling dimension, you would see the answer is five, too large, much larger yeah. than space-time dimension. But there's a non perturbative effect. It is because even if you turn on the interaction and it flows to zero, perturbative, for example, here, I turn on interaction by this much, it flows to zero <laughs> and the scaling dimension. But at this sure, point- Sure, that makes sense. Sorry, I thought your old plot was saying that was true even for very small g that you were in Yeah, 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 not the small g. Okay, our okay. G. So then, I, then I, have, I agree, yeah. We, we looks... need to have a finite gc and the gc is a finite value of five, something like that, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So so it is a non, that's, that's what I mean by it is a non-perturbative effect. It's not a interaction perturbatively cannot lead to any non-trivial effect, but you need to add that non-perturbatively. And the way to reliably analyze this non perturbative effect is to go away from the free fermion fixed point and go to this fixed point, go to the fixed point where the interaction is marginal. And then you can analyze this uh, physics there. So, uh, so essentially it's like that. And the reason that this interaction, although it looks perturbative, but it still have an effect, is because even if you turn on the interaction in originally, for example, to here, it flows to zero, but during the flow, when the interaction flows to zero during this process, it renormalizes the interaction renormalizes the Lattinger parameter. And as the interaction renormalizes the Lattinger parameter, Lattinger parameter controls the scaling dimension of all operators in your CFT. And then uh, the Lattinger parameter can be renormalized in such a way that it reduces the interaction, the scaling dimension of the interaction itself. So at the beginning, when you turn on interaction, it has no effect in terms of gapping, but it is secretly doing the work in reducing its own scaling dimension <laughs> until its own scaling dimension gets reduced to a point where it becomes marginal and the interaction start to do the job mm -hmm. of gapping. Mm 
uh, if you further turn on the even larger interaction, it will become relevant and then it will gap out the system. So that is actually the picture. So this figure is what we obtain in DMRG simulation. Uh, we can use uh, numerics to calculate the scaling dimension of different operators. And then we can perform our numerics at different uh, coupling strengths of the interaction. And at every point we measure the scaling dimension of this uh, six fermion interaction operator. And we can, in, uh, we can really see that it is, uh, its scaling dimension is indeed secretly dropping even before the gap is not opening uh, all along before, before G which is GC, but still something secretly is happening that the interaction is getting more and more relevant until the transition happened. So the transition happened when the scaling dimension reaches two, that is where the interaction becomes marginal and that leads to a KT transition. That's the nature of the transition. So, uh, so, 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 so beyond this point, when G greater than GC, then the interaction gets renormalized re in such a way that it becomes relevant and flow strong under RG. So only after G greater than GC that the interaction has an effect to drive all the condensable operator to condense and eventually gap out all the fermions. Mm -hmm. And uh, when the condensable operator condenses, then the remaining operator in your, uh, in your, a lot in liquid theory that braids non-trivially with the condensable operator will all get gapped. For example, all the fermion operator, one can check that they braid non-trivially. Braid means that uh, this K matrix, K inverse matrix tells you the braiding of these uh, vertex operators. And then one can check that the fermion all gets gapped because they braid non-trivially with all these operators that condense on the boundary. And that generates a mass gap for the fermion. So that's the idea. And then at the SMG critical point, so we are very interested in this critical point. As I said, we really need to move away from the free fermion fixed point and go to here and try to study what's the, uh, uh, what's the effect of interaction or is there anything we can predict here? So actually we, in our numerics, we focus on this region and we try to see uh, what's the scaling dimension of the fermion operator. Uh, at the SMG critical point, the fermion operator intuitively, the fermion operator must have a larger, higher scaling dimension. The reason is that uh, at the free fermion fixed point, the fermion operator has a scaling dimension of one half and it just decay. The fermion fermion two point correlation decay in a power law manner. But in the SMG phase, the fermion should decay, two point function should decay exponentially. So that mean, means if you want to smoothly interpret a power law decay and the exponential decay, then probably you, you would imagine that the power needs to get larger and larger until power goes to infinity, then it's like an exponential decay. So that's, that's the intuition. So we, we conjecture that uh, the fermion scaling dimension is actually larger at the, at the critical point compared to its free fermion fixed point limit. And that's what we check in our numerics. So because our numerics is performed on a two-dimensional, like a, we, we have a two-dimensional quantum hole insulator, which has two edges. So now we, well, only on one edge, we apply the interaction. So now we can do a control kind of a calculation that on the edge that we apply interaction, we can calculate the fermion scaling dimension there. And on the edge, we don't apply interaction, it still remains as a free fermion. So we still can monitor there what's the fermion scaling dimension. And what we can see as a control group on the chiral sector, the fermion still remain gapless and its scaling dimension remain the same throughout. Uh, even if the interaction on the other edge is very strong. And the interaction, uh, at the critical point, we do see that the fermion has a much larger uh, scaling dimension uh, compared to the free limit. So, so that's 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 before the before gapping. And then when you enter the SMG phase, the fermion scaling dimension just diverge. It becomes exponential decay. So you cannot uh, make sense the scaling dimension. So we cannot have any data afterwards. So, uh, so that's what we see. So, so this is actually uh, uh, I think one of the features of uh, SMG, that's SMG transition. That's I think a general idea is maybe at the SMG transition, fermion will always has a larger scaling dimension. This, this of course is now confirmed in one plus one D, but uh, I, I suspect this also applies to higher dimensions. And, and actually that's uh, one motivation for us to propose a theory, few theories such that as fermion fractionalization in higher dimension in order to understand these uh, higher scaling dimension. Uh, but I won't talk about that maybe today. 
There is another alternative way to view this multi-fermion interaction. So this is the six fermion interaction, but it turns out it can also be rewrite as a Yukawa boson mediated uh, like a in interaction. So you can write down a Yukawa Higgs theory where the fermion couples to this Yukawa field phi. Phi is some boson, scalar boson field uh, in a bilinear manner, but this phi itself has some dynamics. Uh, has, so if you start from this Yukawa theory and integrate out this uh, boson field, then one can regenerate this four, uh, six fermion interaction. And it turns out that the reason is that it doesn't couple to the boson in a, the ordinary way. So it's not like a four fermion interaction to mediate. Because for example, these two fermions, psi one and psi three, you can annihilate them and that will generate two phi one bosons. And the two phi one boson will, will, will couple to this uh, psi two and psi four. So that's the Feynman diagram. So you can see the whole process will involve six fermion eventually, but, uh, but you, can, you can still write it as a Yukawa type of uh, interaction, which is mediated by some boson. So as the fermion carry all these uh, three zero, five four, five, four five, and zero three charge, you can also try to infer what's the charge of the boson. For example, the first type of the Yukawa boson carry charge four two, and the second type of Yukawa boson carry charge two four. And then you can show that the whole Feynman diagram charge is conserved. The whole process preserves the U1 cross U1 prime symmetry, but you can have these uh, Yukawa bosons to mediate uh, both interactions. So, so these are the two Feynman diagram that correspond to these two six fermion interactions. So, but with this kind of understanding, you now can write the full theory as some chi chirofermion coupled to some boson, and then there are some boson dynamics. So if suppose these boson field phi one and phi two condenses, this, this will generate by linear mass for the fermion because you can, as you can see here, if I, they take, uh, if they have finite vacuum expectation value, then the fermion immediately acquire a mass. But this is also, but if they have vacuum expectation value of phi field, will all, also break U1 cross U1 prime symmetry because these phi bosons, as we just mentioned previously, they carry non-trivial charge under U1 cross U1 prime. So you can't really condense them. Once you condense them, yes, if you condense them, you provide mass to the fermion, but also at the price of breaking the symmetry. So what can, I, what can we do? Well, notice that this is a one plus one D system. So in one plus one D continuous symmetry cannot be spontaneous broken. So if you write down a theory like that, which has a U1 cross U1 symmetry on the action level, then there's no way to break this U1 cross U1 continuous symmetry even spontaneously in, at low energy. That's the mermin wagner theorem. So at the best, what the boson field can do is not to condense, but to end up in a so-called algebraic long range order phase or sometimes called quasi long range order phase. Well, the correlation of the boson instead of in the disorder phase where the correlation decay exponentially, in this algebraic long range order phase, the correlation of the boson decay in a power law manner. So the boson will have some correlation, which goes like a power Z, Z is like the space time coordinate X plus IT. And for both flavor of the boson A equals one and two, it decays in a certain power law manner with a scaling dimension determined by the boson scaling dimension. So what does it mean? This power law decay has two uh, consequences. The first consequence is that the power law decay, meaning that the correlation length of this boson field diverges. There's no length scale. So if the correlation length diverges, that means boson correlation length is much larger than the fermion correlation length. No matter what's the fermion correlation length, a diverging number is always larger than a finite number. So, so that means uh, the fermion will locally see a gap because locally fermion will see this boson as if it is condensed. Uh, and then it, it, it is just, it's just at the long range, it doesn't have a constant long range order, but the, every local position, you, you can imagine that the boson condensed and its correlation length is infinite. So the fermion will just see this local bilinear mass. So that allows fermion to gap opening. And as long as fermion opens a gap, fermion correlation length will become very short. 
And the fermion correlation length is finite. And in that case, it cannot compete with the boson correlation length. So within the correlation length of the fermion field, fermion will never know that the boson actually is disordered Fer because fermion cannot see the boson disorder at the long, long length scale because the boson correlation length is much larger than the fermion. However, because it is still a power law decay, it doesn't have a constant tail in the end. So it still had, cannot establish a reliable vacuum expectation value. So then in that sense, there's still no symmetry breaking. So we achieve a case where we do not break the symmetry of the, uh, of the original U1 cross U1, uh, but we still provide fermion some local bilinear mass. And this local bilinear mass is just fluctuating at a larger scale such that it restores the symmetry. But at a local scale, the fermion still sees the gap everywhere. And then fermion can't tell that the boson actually is this disorder because fermion's correlation length now is much shorter than the boson's. So that's uh, actually a very intuitive picture about what happens in symmetric mass generation. It's essentially the fermion bilinear mass disordered by quantum fluctuation. And then this has important implications for fermion Green's function. Uh, and this implication even goes beyond one plus one D. So for free fermion, let's say, so from now on, from this point on, I'm going to jump out of this one plus one D example and talk about something more general in general dimensions. So let's consider some free fermion in D dimensional space time where the action looks like this. Then what's the fermion two point function? Two point function is just the two point fermion fermion correlation. And we know that in the momentum space, if you Fourier transform this two point function to the momentum space, the answer is this, it's just the inverse kernel of this uh, free fermion. So uh, that's simple. So this Green's function, let, let me start from the free fermion limit and I will mention uh, SMG later. So at least in this free fermion limit, when the free fermion has an ordinary fermion bilinear mass, it has a Green's function that looks like this. And the Green's function has several important features. First of all, if you look at the denominator, the denominator goes to zero point, uh, actually specify the poles of the fermions, the poles of the Green's function. And the pole actually, uh, tells you the on shell condition of the fermion, and then that specify the dispersion relation of the fermion, which is standard. And based on this dispersion relation, you, our understanding is that you can define the so-called rest mass. Rest mass is actually the energy gap. It's, it's, it's the kind of E equals MC squared kind of mass. So that's called rest mass. Let, let me call it the rest mass. Just bear with me with this definition. It's the energy gap of the fermion excitation. We can also maybe define the inertial mass. The inertial mass is the F equals MA kind of mass, which is which may not be the same as E equals MC kind of mass, right? So, so let me call it inertial mass, which is defined as the curvature of the dispersion, inverse of the cur sec curvature of the dispersion near, near the bent bottom. So that's also a mass. So for the free fermion case, we can see both rest mass and inertial mass uh, is, uh, is essentially this M absolute value is related to the absolute value of M. But there is also another mass in a free fermion case that is the so-called bilinear mass vacuum expectation value. By that, I just mean side by side vacuum expectation value. That is also non-vanishing in this case. And that mass has to do with M times some non-universal function of uh, absolute value of M, which is not important. So that mass is also not zero. So you can see in our conventional free fermion, massive free fermion, we have simultaneously three mass gets opened. But symmetric mass generation is a mechanism which only open the first two mass, but not the last mass. Because you can see the first two mass only has to do with the absolute value of the mass. But the last mass has to do really with this mass, whether it's positive or negative. This vacuum expectation value has some kind of, even it can be a complex number. It can have a phase factor there. So, so only the last mass has to do with M itself. The, the other mass is, has to do with the amplitude of the M. So symmetric mass generation essentially is you keep the amplitude of the mass, but you disorder the direction of the mass such that you don't see any fermion bilinear expectation value and you will not break the symmetry because this fermion bilinear mass term, once it has a vacuum expectation value, usually breaks symmetries because it transforms non-trivially under the symmetry. So that's essentially the idea. So based on this idea, if, the, if we can just interpret as disordering fermion bilinear mass without turning off its amplitude, then we can do something 
non-trivial to this uh, Green's function, to this fermion two-point function. We start from the free fermion, free massive fermion Green's function. And we just look at this Green function and we say, oh, so these mass on the numerator, it fluctuates with the symmetry transformation. I need to turn it off. But on the denominator, it enters as the absolute value square. So it doesn't matter. The amplitude doesn't still have a non-trivial average, but the mass itself has a trivial average. So that means probably I want to rewrite the Green's function in this form. So then there's a conjecture that this is the Green's function of the, of the fermion two-point function in the SMG phase. So the difference between a free massive fermion and an SMG fermion relies in its two-point function. The two-point function has an important difference on the numerator, such that one has the mass term that breaks the symmetry. And the other, you can see under symmetry transformation, mass term just rotate. But, the, but this Green's function now is fully symmetric under the rotation of the mass term. So that is what we mean by symmetric mass. It provides a mass term to the fermion on the denominator as a pole. If you look at the pole of the Green's function, you can still see that the pole or the dispersion relation of the fermion is completely the same as usual, but it doesn't lead to symmetry breaking because you eliminate the symmetry breaking mass on the numerator. And then that gives you uh, this non-trivial Green's function. But this Green's function, as since it's different from the free fermion, free, free fermion case, it must have some other additional structure where you can prove the difference, right? And then our proposal is that the difference lies in what? Lies in these zeros. Because this Green's function, you can see, once you don't have the mass on the numerator, then the Green's function actually has additional zeros, which are these two lines. Where the horizontal axis is a momentum, the vertical axis is a frequency. When the momentum equals frequency on this light cone, basically, you can see the k mu actually kind of is zero in, in some sense. So, so along this light cone, you will you you will have a vanishing numerator and then uh, the denominator, but the denominator is not vanishing. When k equals zero, uh, the denominator is still controlled by mass, but the numerator will vanish. So you will obtain uh, lines of or a cone of zeros in your uh, momentum energy space. So that cone of zeros or that uh, Green's function zeros is um, the smoking gun feature of symmetric mass generation. So we propose that every symmetric mass generation phase, uh, if you inspect its uh, fermion two-point function or the Green's function, you should see that the, in the momentum energy space that there are always be regions separated by fermion uh, Green's function zeros, and this zero must also touch the zero energy and zero momentum point. So the Green's function zero is specified by the by the region between the determinant of the Green's function less than zero and determinant of Green's function greater than zero. Because in general, Green's function is not a number; it can be a matrix. So what do I mean by it is zero? I really mean that its determinant is zero. So this is the this Green's function actually is also proposed by Simon, and also among the same time we'll also write down the same form in in this paper. So essentially, that's what I said. In in terms of pole, you still have the same quasi particle excitation. It's still well defined. The uh, the quasi fermion quasi particles still well defined above the gap with the finite rest mass and the finite inertial mass. So symmetric mass generation really brings rest mass and inertial mass to the fermion, <laughs> but it doesn't bring fermion bilinear mass term. There's no bilinear condensation. The reason is that the side by side expectation value is nothing but the uh, momentum frequency integration of the Green's function because Green function is side by side essentially. You just need to integrate over the momentum space. And then this integration must vanish. The reason is because the Green's function now is odd under K. You can see this is an odd function of K mu. So, so integration is going to vanish by symmetry requirement. And then uh, the, the fact that this Green's function is odd under K is also uh, re required by the Green's function zero, that you must have a zero of your determinant of the Green's function uh, at zero frequency. And then there is actually a non-perturbative argument for why the determinant of the Green's function must be zero at zero frequency. The reason is that you can view, for example, let's go back to this one plus one D case. And let's view this one plus one D system as the boundary of a two plus one D uh, uh, domain war between a uh, fermion SPT phase and the trivial phase. So we can treat this 1D gapless fermion system as certain boundary between uh, 
uh, fermion topological phase and trivial phase in two plus one D. So along this boundary, the one D fermion is uh, 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 maybe a gapless. So you can start from such a scenario and then you can, along the boundary, you can turn on interaction. So before I turn on the interaction, the full boundary is just gapless 1D fermion. And for gapless 1D fermion, you can see the determinant of G inverse is zero because they are pole at zero energy. So, so the pole means that the green function is going to diverge at zero energy. So, so that's what happens for gapless. But then you turn on interaction gradually uh, in, the space, in, in, in the spatial di direction, along this direction, until you reach a point where interaction is strong enough and drive the system into SMG. But why do I still need some fictitious boundary here? It is because if you calculate the topological index in the trivial phase, it is going to be different from the uh, from this uh, certain topological index in the interacting uh, in, in, in the SPT phase in the in on the other side. Uh, so, so the index that I propose is that uh, people actually, it's not I propose, it's people propose, you can start from the fermion two-point function and evaluate certain G inverse partial G kind of uh, uh, thing. And then you do a, a momentum space integration. That is basically TKNN integer or something like that. That's, uh, that's basically, you can do that on the free fermion level and calculate the index on both sides. And this uh, calculation is valid because I didn't turn on any interaction on both sides. I only turn on interaction along this boundary. So I can still well define this index here. But this index is an integer. And then this integer cannot jump abruptly, cannot jump smoothly. It must jump only because this integration encounters certain singularity. And this integration is singular only if the integrand inside this integration diverge. So the, the index can only change if there's some divergence in the integral, and then the integration is not well-defined, then passing that point, you may have a different index. So the integral can only diverge, either G inverse has a divergence or G has a divergence. You can see G and G inverse has the same, uh, it's almost on equal footing in this expression. So for free fermion case, uh, when, when the fermion, when the boundary is gapless, when there's no sufficient uh, interaction to gap out the fermion, then basically the index jump because uh, the determinant of G goes to, G inverse goes to zero, meaning that G diverges. The Green's function diverge at the, at the, at the zero frequency because it touches the pole of the gapless fermion. But if the fermion gets gapped by some interaction, then you no longer have any pole at the zero energy. So your determinant of G inverse uh, is no longer zero. So G, meaning that G does not diverge. Then if G does not diverge, G inverse must diverge. G inverse diverge means that the determinant of G equals zero, then G inverse diverge, essentially. So you must have this uh, non-trivial determinant in order, or you must have this zero determinant either in the G inverse section or in the G section in order to uh, drive this divergence of the integrand and in order to explain the abrupt change between this index on both sides. So this is a topological requirement that we must have uh, Green's function zero in the SMG phase. And that statement is actually consistent with just what we said, this, uh, this form of the Green's function. So I- Sorry, uh, may I ask one question? Um, yeah. So can you explain, uh, so, is there any relation between the green function zero and the vanishing of the vacuum expectation value? Yeah, 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 yeah. So the, 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 it's, not, it's not directly related. It should, I should say it all comes from the fact that the green function is an odd function of momentum. Uh -huh. So, so that, statement, that statement simultaneously applied to here. If it is yeah. an odd function, okay. then the space-time integral will vanish. If it is an odd function, then at omega zero, you must have a point, actually, at omega nk equals zero as an odd function, uh -huh. right? It explicitly tell you that there is a point. There is a point where the determinant of g vanishes. So you, can, you cannot directly using the green function zero to show that the vacuum expectation value must be zero. You, you need to rely yeah, yeah, yeah. You can it. directly using this uh, fact that the green function is an odd function in the SMG phase to show that the uh, vacuum mm -hmm. expectation value mass managed. Yeah. Actually, if, if you put the plus M here, immediately it is not an odd function in K and immediately you get the non-trivial vacuum expectation value here. So it's all consistent with the fact that we just, what we do is we put, we, we remove this 
M on the numerator and then immediately restore the symmetry. And that also uh, leads to the oddness of the Green's function. And this oddness is just another way of formulate that is just saying that the Green's function must have zero at zero frequency. Mm -hmm. so, so this is a consistent story, yeah. Uh, so by the way, um, do you have comments about the zeros and the poles of the Green function with respect to the generalized Latinger theorem? Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's a very good question. That's like, um, because in Lattinger theorem, uh, generalized version, that uh, Lattinger volume is defined by both pole and zero. Yeah. So you may wonder whether, uh, for, for example, today I talk about symmetric mass generation only for Dirac fermion, where you don't have a Lattinger volume. But you can also ask for a fermion which has a Fermi surface, Fermi liquid, that you have a Lattinger volume. Can I also in apply interaction to get out the Fermi surface trivially? And if that happens, there must be some consequence left over because you can't violate this generalized Lattinger theorem. You can't just get rid of all this fermion without any leaving any consequence. So the idea is that it leaves zeros on the original Fermi surface. It replaces the Fermi surface by original is a pole by zero, replace pole by zero. So you still don't violate Lattinger vo volume, but you can gap out fermions on the Fermi surface as well using the same idea by interaction. So yeah, that's uh, something we are uh, studying right now, actually. Okay. Yeah, okay. We haven't finished that project. But uh, I think uh, in general, that's uh, that's what uh, everything what I want to say. So the summary, summary slides, let me go through that. So the symmetric mass generation uh, in general is a novel mechanism to give fermion a mass without bilinear condensation, uh, this allowing gap out the fermion without breaking the symmetry. So that's the take home message. And we discussed that there are two conditions. One is uh, that is more, more well accept that you need to cancel all the anomaly, but that's just one condition. And you also need to check that your interaction really satisfied the gapping condition. This part is less well understood. I think it's a future direction, uh, especially this uh, condition. Sorry, Nijan. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sorry, just before you move on, can I ask a question okay. regarding the Fermi surface? comment that you made. Oh, okay. <laughs> because you, you said that at least in this um, Cairo Fermion model, for yeah. uh, Cairo Fermion model, you written down, uh, you said that you can put in mass terms, right? So how do you get a doping term and get a Fermi surface? The mass terms are going to break the U1, U1 prime oh, symmetry. Mass term and doping term are still different terms. Mass term is side by side, doping term is side dagger side. Uh, Why isn't that also forbidden? So, so another thing is that we are changing the symmetry. When we go to firm, it's completely different system. I'm not saying we start okay. from this system and turn on doping. No, I'm not doing that. I'm, okay. I'm starting some other system where fermion already has doping. So then the symmetry, any symmetry that, that doesn't allows you to dope the system is not a symmetry in my system. Yeah, I yeah, yes. Yeah. So yeah. I was, yeah, I was thinking about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, I'm not okay. doing that, that thing. Yeah, I, I, I just want to start from some Fermi liquid. Well, okay. maybe Fermi liquid. Now, nowadays we know that Fermi liquid has a the U1 loop group symmetry as an emergent right, symmetry. Right, right, yeah. right. So what I want to preserve is this U1 loop group symmetry. Okay, uh, and okay. then I want to discuss, if you want to preserve this loop group symmetry, it's also very strong symmetry. And then if forbidden mm -hmm. all the fermion bilinear mass terms, you can't really gap out the Fermi surface by superconductivity that's going to break mm -hmm. this one. You can't break it by uh, gap out by, uh, by a charge density wave that's going to break translation, which is also part of the loop group of U1. So uh, what, what can you do? <laughs> can you use interaction to achieve something non-trivial that uh, can still uh, doesn't violate anomaly constraint? Of course, uh, if you only have a single Fermi surface, you may have uh, anomaly because this loop group you right. want has a Fermi surface anomaly. So you first need to design some nice way that you cancel the anomaly and then, then you think about ways to use interaction to gap out the Fermi. So that's the idea over there. So that's completely orthogonal to, to this model okay. itself. Okay, yeah. okay, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so that's uh, essentially uh, what I want to say. And then I want to say that in terms of the features, uh, this, this I didn't mention that uh, in higher dimension, it turns out we can use uh, uh, 
uh, some fermion fractionalization idea to understand SMG transition. So the SMG transition turns out to be some deconfined quantum criticality. So that relates to some non-trivial CFT with enlarged fermion scaling dimension. And then inside the SMG phase, there's also an important feature. That's what I just mentioned, that you have fermion Green's function zero. And then it has many applications such as lattice regularization, uh, for, for standard model of brain unified theory. Uh, recently, also people also apply it uh, to search for new candidates of non susi duality. And Juven also has a paper recently on a new perspective on strong CP problem, maybe uh, solvable by ideas of symmetric mass generation. And then uh, it also allows us to construct uh, interacting SPT phases is also related to SPT phase in condensed matter physics and potentially provides new insights. That's that's my last comment <laughs> to pseudo gap physics in high temperature superconductor, where the goal is to gap out Fermi surface without breaking symmetry. So, so the idea to remove fermion from low energy without breaking symmetry by interaction, I think is a very general thing. And then if we understand symmetric mass generation better, it can have many more applications. So that's it for today. Thank you for your attention. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, um, thank you very much. Uh -huh. um, may, may I start with a very um, trivial question? So you yeah. mentioned there are different type of uh, mass terms and uh, um, you have a rest mass. I think this corresponds to the uh, charge gap in the condensed matter language. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah in yeah, the yeah. condensed matter, we also know there are um, spin gap and a neutron gap. Um, uh -huh, uh -huh. We understand them. Uh, are, uh, are they correspond to different uh, symmetry charge of the fermion operators? Uh, yeah, yeah, maybe. So, so, so if you have a charge gap without the spin gap, that probably means your fermion is already spin charge separated. So then probably you want to discuss this mass for charge on and spin on separately. Uh -huh. So you can't really just use a simple idea of fermion mass to simultaneously describe a situation where you have a charge gap without a spin gap. So the um, neutron gap just means that the fermion doesn't carry charge. Uh... Yeah, 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 maybe. I, I may not be so familiar with every <laughs> this uh, notion, but I what I know is that uh, right in quantum spin liquids you can have charge gap, but you can you, you don't need to have a spin gap. Spin excitation can be gapless, but in that case, fermion original electron need to uh, fractionalize into bosonic and uh, I mean from spin on things like that. So. Uh -huh. And the, the symmetric mass generation is any spin connect, uh, connected to the uh, multi insulator, uh, interaction chamber multi insulator? Are they same or different? I, I think they are the same in the sense that they correspond to the multi insulating phase uh, yeah. when the feeling is integer. Uh -huh. So when the feeling is integer, we say it's a band insulator, meaning that's a trivial insulator. But it, modern insulator can still exist. <laughs> integer feeling is a strong interaction version of. Uh, so so here, for example, all, all our system has zero Lattinger volume. So essentially, it's in terms of feeling, it's like an integer feeling. And then uh, in that case, if you can have some mod insulator, that's called the symmetric mass generation. That's essentially the idea driven by so intact. Yeah. So it's a band insulator plus interaction? Yeah. Uh -huh. okay. Band insulator, if it is already insulating, usually yeah. you don't need interaction, right? Yeah. But yeah. there are band insulator, which in terms of feeling is like a band insulator, but in terms of band structure, it's still not, <laughs> like while semi-metal. And then uh, in that case, uh, you can try to ask whether I can use interaction to, uh -huh. uh, to, to drive things. Because the reason that I require uh, integer uh -huh. feeling, I want to cancel anomaly. If the feeling is not integer, then there's a LSM theorem that's, uh, that's basically saying that the system is anomalous. You cannot uh, enter a mod insulating phase without any consequence. You must uh, develop topological order or something else. So, uh, so that's why I don't want to say it's mod insulator in the conventional sense, because conventionally, mod insulator comes with LSM an anomaly, and that leads to non-trivial consequence. But here, it's really the mod insulator without anomaly. So that's like a band insulator 
insulate a plus detection. But in terms of dynamics, it's same. It's still, it's still because of interaction, it gives a gap to the fermion. So in that sense, it's the same, yeah. I see. So the um, like um, interaction driven, if you have yeah. some yeah, interaction you can still say surface, that. Yeah. surface topological insulator, um, and uh, uh, like uh, um, time reversal invariant function, this is not included. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Those topological order is not included because okay. that okay. requires anomaly, and yeah. SG is specific to anomaly free yeah. systems. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So Simon, you can unmute. Yeah. Oh. Uh, oh yeah, I am. Sorry, yeah. I just wanted to uh, make a point. Uh, thanks for a very nice talk, actually. That was great. Um, that you can build mirror models, of course, using these Kähler Dirac fermions as well. Mm -hmm. And one advantage of those things is though the the anomalies, the anomaly structure of those theories uh, survives under discretization. So you can connect directly from your lattice model into the continuum uh, in a way which is kind of um, it's very clear uh, when symmetric mass generation will work or not. So that's one part of that. And the second part of that is mm -hmm. it looks like you can embed certain types of chiral theories into those Kähler Dirac theories in such a way that I think you have another potential route to uh, um, construct lat uh, chiral lattice gauge theories using this sort of by embedding chiral fields into these Kähler Dirac fields. So there's just a, I mean, I'm sure you're probably aware, but I just wanted to make the point that the, the, uh, there are other routes to using symmetric mass generation uh, involving mm -hmm. you know lattice fermions of different types that's all mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i see yeah, yeah i mean you. maybe you haven't seen my most recent paper but it's it, it, yeah um, i should maybe read read those yeah <laughs> <laughs> but it's 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 kind of amazing that these things have exact anomalies even for finite numbers of degrees of freedom and you can follow those anomalies into the continuum and they give you direct constraints I uh, see. I really uh, wish to talk with you more on that maybe later. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess we're going to chat again at some point soon. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. yeah. Anyway, just a quick part, comment. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thanks mm -hmm. for the talk. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, so if not, let's thank you, uh, Idram, uh, again. Uh, thank you for this very clear talk. And, uh, yeah. uh, we enjoyed it a lot. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Yeah. See you. Thank, thank you. you. Mm -hmm.